we'll now open it up for questions and for comments. And I simply uh, ask you to um, let me know. Yes. And if you were to say uh, uh, who you are and um, your background. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Christine Tötzke. I had the Division Peace and Security at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. I would like to thank um, Mr. Lowcock and Mrs. Hartmann very much for their very interesting and excellent speeches. Um, I recognized a lot of um, challenges and issues we, we are facing here in Germany as well. I thank you that you, that you actually mentioned our, our strategy. And um, I think we, we actually have a lot of commonalities. Um, in Germany, more than uh, half, of, half of our partner countries um, in development cooperation are actually um, fragility and conflict affected. And as you mentioned, this poses a risk to uh, regional and global security. It poses a lot of very, very bad consequences and effects on the people that li live in these countries. And that is why um, we say um, in fragile and conflict affected countries there is no business as usual. Um, and we identified in, in our strategy some principles which should be um, adopted when we design projects um, um, in these countries. I would like, just like to mention a few and I think some, some of these um, were, were actually also mentioned in your speech. Um, for example, that um, we try to design the engagement context related and we know that um, it is not the case that it's only least development, least development countries that are mm -hmm. Um, fragile states, but according to new OECD research, it's more and more also MICs that are conflict um, affected, and we have to differentiate a lot. Um, we have to formulate realistic objectives, and we have to um, improve our risk management at all levels, personal risks, but institutional risks as well, and reputational risks. And we have to design these strategies with local structures and uh, combine rapid results with long-term development because we do not want to wait 50, 54 years, as Mrs. Hartmann said. Um, I have um, two questions for um, Mr. Lowcock. And the first is on the whole of government approach <laughs> you mentioned. Um, you also mentioned um, that um, the German government adopted in September last year interministerial guidelines on international engagement in fragile states. And they actually foresee the establishment of task forces with a regional focus. And they are not, as you have in, in Great Britain, um, permanent structures um, like your stabilization unit or your, or your conflict pools, but they... they um, they actually want to to um, to uh, to have the same purpose, like joint analysis, joint strategies, and um, a better coordination and coherence. So, but we are also we are always thinking of maybe we could do better. But I have the questions, um, especially concerning your your conflict pool. Do you do you have any evidence that the um, the measures you you fund out of this pool um, actually produce better results and improve effectiveness. That would be of interest for us. Or is it just mainly about more coherence, coordination, sitting at one table and, and getting a better picture of each other? That would be of interest for me. And um, the second question is on the, on the um, uh, report of the high-level uh, panel of government persons, and I absolutely agree with you. I think it's an excellent starting point for promoting peace and security in the post-MDG agenda. Um, but it's only a starting point. It is not a given, and I think the real work starts now. And what is your um, opinion on how um, this can be promoted or how the momentum can be kept. Because we all know that it is very difficult and there are um, groups of states and countries who might not actually agree on these issues, having it integrated in the, in the post-MDG framework. And what do you think bilateral donors could do? Or should we leave it to the G7 plus? Thank you. Would you like to um, have a mic? 
I think that, um, Can you hear me okay if I, yeah? Um, firstly, thank you very much for your, for your comments. And I agree with everything you said in your commentary. Not more evidence of the commonality of view between BMZ and, and DFOD on these issues. Thank you. On your first question, um, I mean, firstly, I think it, it, it is really, really important to have a common strategy um, across the government, which each department may have separate responsibilities for implementing parts of, but unless you have a common strategy, you're bound in the country to be rubbing up in, uh, you know, against problems. So, you know, if, if the British ambassador in Afghanistan were um, to say one set of things on, say, the security sector, and the DFID team were to say something else, that's transparently a recipe for chaos and that doesn't happen. Um, so common strategies are, you know, they, they are it themselves an important advance on certainly some experiences I had 20 years ago when even in my own government without giving any secrets away. Um, I, I do think, though, there's also common, common kind of resources and capabilities which can be um, drawn on. So you talked about the stabilisation unit, and that is a... Basically, it's a roster of more than a thousand people with a wide range of skill sets who can be put to work, uh, depending on what the issue is, to help tackle a problem in a particular country. I talked about the initiative the UK is promoting on um, tackling sexual violence in conflict. And we have uh, specialists and experts on that problem who can be drawn on and sent out to whether it's Eastern DRC or to um, whatever the country is, um, but don't have just to be sitting there waiting for the event to arise. They have day jobs as well, but they can be drawn on and put to work when there's a particular problem. And, and that, that for us has been an improvement on the situation in the past where we would be kind of scrabbling around to find the right people who we hadn't thought about the possibility of needing in advance. So, so uh, coming now to your question, well, what hard evidence can we um, offer about the improved impact you get if you work together um, across government? I mean, really, the best evidence is the counterfactual. If you look at all the cases, and there's uh, not least generated by the World Bank, a very healthy grey literature, if you look at all the cases where, say, um, a donor has tried to engage in the police sector or oversight of the defence sector, without bringing a wide variety of perspectives to bear, you see universal failure, essentially. Um, the flip side is not that when you join up in your own government, you do a better job for the partner country in every case or that you automatically quickly solve the problems. Of course not. Some of these problems, as, as you were saying, are inherently intractable. But there is evidence that you tend to do, you tend to make slightly fewer mistakes and you solve problems slightly quicker than you would otherwise do. And um, we've had, we have an independent commission on aid impact in the UK. It's looked at some of these cases and it doesn't say everything goes swimmingly, but it does say you tend to do a little bit better. I think actually the more research is done and the more studies are done, the better, because this is still, although, as I said in my remarks earlier, this is better studied than in the past, it's still understudied. Coming on to your question about the post-NDGs, um, really this is, the ball is in the Secretary General's court now. He has to decide what he's going to do with the report that um, Horst Kohler and David Cameron and others have offered him. Uh, he has to send it to the General Assembly. The General Assembly will then have to decide what they want to do, what kind of new framework do all the members of the United Nations want to put in place after 2015. And that's an inherently challenging political <laughs> process and this, you know, the only strategy available to us is to engage with that process. I have been very positively struck by um, how positively the report has been received. Uh, you know, we weren't sure how all those ideas would land around the world, candidly, and um, talking in particular to the hardest audience to please on this agenda, which is the permanent representatives of every country 
their ambassadors to the UN in New York. That's a hard, hard crowd to please, I can tell you. They, their initial reception is very, very positive. So we will see. Um, certainly, we think that the MDG framework has had enormous... Um, traction and potency. It's been a very good thing for the world. It's been associated with the fastest ever decline in extreme poverty the world has ever seen. Um, you can argue about whether some of that progress would have been made without the MDGs. I think it's quite hard to argue that they didn't help with it. So replacing the current framework with something else with equal power and potency is a big prize, and we must all collectively do the best we can to win the prize. Do you agree with that assessment, Antoine? Uh, of the UN panel? Yes, and also, what is your take on the question uh, that we've just heard? Uh, what, uh, what would be the next uh, necessary step? Um, well, since now I'm captured by academia, I look at it from an academic point of view, and I must say you're very positive. This panel is very positive in terms of the, the poverty reduction. And there is, you know, economists never agree and there's a big debate to what extent that outlook is not too positive, um, because essentially what this, pan, this paper, the assumption is, and that uh, has to do with the research of the chair, Homi Karas, is that the present GDP growth is projected, which shows that in many countries, poverty will be lifted, people will be lifted out of poverty, particularly in the Asian countries. Um, but it doesn't really look at changes in dynamics, like in inequality, which I argue could lead to more conflict. And in fact, we could see not as rapid decline in the poverty as we assume in the paper. So my own take on that, if you ask for my somewhat intuitive, is that it focus, it, it underemphasizes the poverty reduction agenda and puts it too much into the corner of it is limited to a few countries. I mean, a set of countries which we call fragile still. I think we will see more of the Nigeria types where we see nice growth, but nonetheless, a lot of people not being included because we see changing inequalities and we see social exclusion. Thank you. But I have, I'm, I'm happy about the recommendations in principle. Yes. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Lukas Kowalski, I work for GAZ. I have two questions. The first one is about the whole of government approach. Uh, the last couple of months, there is very critical discussion in Germany about the German integrated approach, whether it works often or not. I think there were examples of task force, which are actually a very nice idea for the Berlin level. The problem from Afghanistan is, of course, how are you going to do that in a fragile situation on the ground. So what is the experience of the DFID, a bridge experience? And the second question you mentioned, finding, finding the right person for the right place for long enough. So what are the incentives? Mm. Uh, how do you get the people of mid-30 plus to countries like Afghanistan? Right. Um, thank you very much. Let me deal with your second, second question first. Um, you, and you're right, it's a big challenge to create um, a kind of staffing system which makes it um, viable, particularly for people in their 30s and 40s, which is typically the age that people are having families and wider responsibilities to go and work in the toughest environments. Um, people who are you know, younger um, tend to find that a little bit easier and interestingly one thing we have we have uh, increasingly found is people later in their careers are often very very highly motivated to go and work in tough places um, maybe they're reconnecting with their youth or something I don't know what's going on there but um, but there's something something like that that's going on we um, have for some of the toughest places like Afghanistan um, put in place tailored arrangements for terms and conditions to make sure we can attract the right skills and the right kind of caliber of people to solve exactly that problem. So, and we, you know, we've tried to look at this because we've been in Afghanistan for 10 years. And uh, so we've had to look at this from a long-term perspective. The first year or two, you think, oh, you can just throw a few people at it and you don't have to worry about managing for the long term. But since this is core business to us, we have to find a system that, that 
works, you know, for a decade or two decades. And, um, you know, um, a third of DFID's um, staff who are based overseas are in places where it's not safe for them either to have their kids there maybe or perhaps they, can have their, their, they can't even have their partner there. So in those kind of places, often we will have a, an arrangement which is you're out in the, the field for six weeks and you come back for two weeks. Um, so there are ways for people to refresh and connect with their families. That certainly is, an, is a system that works for quite a lot of people with families. Um, you think carefully about tour lengths. So um, we have had people who've served for up to three years in Afghanistan. That is really the outer limit of what's sensible. Most of, our, most of my colleagues do, will do a maximum of two years, uh, be, you know, you, because you have to look after people's uh, mental health and their physical well-being and think about the job they're going to do afterwards and the fact that you want them to be a great staff member in 10 years' time, not just now. So you, you, you have to look at each country on its merits, work out the right package for that environment. To, to hire people who are up for this, especially at the mid-career level, in DFID we've hired 500 mid-career professionals in the last two years, largely people who are, who are interested in working in these tough environments, and then you have to look after them. Um, just remind me of your first question again. Uh, Right. And a gap between the headquarter level and field. Right. Um, well, I don't know the system so well here, but the, the thing that, that is important for us is firstly that both at the London end and in the country, the teams are very well integrated. So the head of the DFID program in Kabul has some personal and financial accountability to me in London, but he is also accountable to the UK ambassador in Kabul. So he has to work as part of a team in Afghanistan as well as thinking about you know, the fiduciary and financial and other responsibilities he has to us in London. So you have to run a matrix, basically. Um, it helps to have the National Security Council and the senior ministers on that are all very well motivated to um, work as a team because that's what David Cameron makes it clear he expects from them. Um, and, you know, you have to have an honest professional <coughs> approach to um, resolving problems. And um, I also, you know, you, you've been teasing me a little bit for being excessively optimistic, and I confess that, you know, if you... You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. If you confront... Um, human misery for 30 years, you have to look on the bright side. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't do that, you, I think you don't do it for 30 years probably. But, but you, you, it's no good just, just being um, rose-tinted. You, you have to be um, serious and look at the evidence and be honest where things aren't working and stop doing those things and try something else. And you have to do that on a cross-government basis, not just ministry by ministry. See if there are other people who want to comment, uh, ask questions. Yes. It's, it's the, lady in the, in the lady in pink. Um, thank you very much for both presentations. Um, I'm Cornelia Dümke. I'm the director of uh, Culture Concepts, a Berlin-based uh, organization. Uh, and uh, I'm working in the development uh, context from this uh, specific perspective, which is the art and cultural development. Um, this uh, regards my question. Uh, I was wondering uh, why the term of culture and the cultural economy did not appear in both presentations. And my question is simple. Uh, how far uh, does, from your perspective, development agencies currently recognize culture and the creative economy in concrete development processes? And secondly, uh, would development agencies do better if they would recognize the cultural dimension of the development process? Thank you. Would you like to...? <laughs> I think it's a really fair question. Um, Neil McGregor, who runs the British Museum, has posed a very similar 
question to me recently, and the head of our British Council uh, makes the same point. I, I think there's, you know, there is something in this actually that um, getting below the um, the kind of economic and political surface does mean understanding the deep things in any country's culture, and you have to do a good job on that if you're really going to understand what some of the underlying drivers are. So I think it's a you know, I think it's a fair point. I, I confess it's not something DFID feels we've been particularly good at, and maybe we should um, have a longer conversation with you to work out how we can be better at it. Neil would certainly be very pleased. Andrew? I must say, I was at the World Bank during the time when Mr. Wolfenson was the president, and he was known as the Renaissance Man, and he said, how can you people do development without looking at culture? And... Uh, he had a hard stand on that to convince his 12,000 collaborators to take this on, uh, but we did. But uh, we have two obstacles. First of all, our, our fo focus today was on conflict of fragile state, and that's a particular challenge in these circumstances. But of course, you often do that, particularly in the absence of state institutions, that you build, try to find, when you build inclusive institutions, that you do build it around cultural processes, cultural consensus, cultural values, particularly since you have to then build, go in the community and build social capital, which is often, often grouped around cultural processes. I would say as a more general, I mean, I, I try to, to, to demonstrate how difficult it is to work in, with development institutes, instruments in conflict situation or fragile state. If we're in a more regular state development process, uh, then I think you know, it is more systematically built in, but let's not fool ourselves. Uh, the counterparts' governments are not keen on letting bilateral or multilateral agencies become involved in that. So you, you do actually fight a battle trying to convince government counterparts, government institutions, to take this on as a serious objective. But it's not, it's not at all there, but I would be lying if I would say that it's a priority agenda. Mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me try to build a bridge there. I think if you look at uh, the creative economy, uh, culture and creative economy, you won't find much of a trace in um, a DFID or um, I think at the various other institutions around the world in, or the, the World Bank, it, it's a very marginal mm -hmm. one. But if you look at culture, like culture and values, mm -hmm. then it, uh, I think it's now seen as more important, particularly in what you said about conflict and conflict prevention. Because uh, what happens in, in fragile states is that you have political or sometimes called cultural entrepreneurs, they come in and exploit mm, sure. cultural differences or value differences, identity issues in a population mm. for ulterior motives. So think about the Milosevic's and, and uh, trying to get hold of this, what is very often a very small group of people and control them early on in the development of conflict is very, very important. Uh, think, just think that if uh, it had been possible to isolate Milosevic and his henchmen, at some point early in the conflict, we would not have had the Balkan Wars, most likely. Right? And this kind of thinking brings in culture and the notion of managing cultural conflicts uh, to prevent uh, it to spill over into other areas of uh, other conflict arenas. So let's see if there's... Um, Anybody else who would like to, to come in? Yes, we have the gentleman here. And you had a question? Is there anybody else who would like to come in? And the lady back there. Let's collect the three. And you, you also want to come in. So let's collect these questions. Thank you. OK, my question is uh, quite short. My name is Lawrence Lauer. I'm, my doctoral thesis borders a little bit on the topic of development aid. And I found in the media that often that the notion is discussed whether aid in conflict areas, uh, you mentioned that as well, um, actually only leads to a prolonging of the conflict by, uh, by fueling, uh, by giving additional resources, especially food. And I'd like to know how you can avoid that. Um, because I, I think there are strategies out there, but uh, I didn't find them in the, yet, so. Very good. And we just go over to the gentleman next door. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name's Sharad Sharma. I'm a, a student here at the Hertie School. Uh, but also, I used to work for you know, one of DFID's major consulting contractors, um, and mainly in sort of uh, fragile and conflict-affected states. 
Uh, my, um, my main question would be, and building off uh, your two points before, is that uh, in conflict afflicted states, we're talking about a very a society which is in flux and an incredibly political situation, whereas a lot of the discourse when we're talking about interventions seems to seem apolitical in a way. Uh, and I just want to highlight some, one of the dangers behind that might be that if somebody, if an institution or if a po politicians have come to power through using uh, very sort of uh, divisive uh, ways, as mm. in a conflict is the case, then trying to support and build those same institutions around the people and work in partnership with those, uh, with the leaders there might, in fact, um, uh, under, under, undercut your objective. So how, how do you work with that? How does DFID become political? Okay, thank you. So they, um, can you raise your hand so we can, we can find you with the mic? There, there you are. Thanks. Good evening. Um, my name is Anna Maria Heisig. I'm not representing any organization. I'm just here by myself. Um, but I wanted to seize the opportunity to ask you a question concerning your professional career and your expertise. Um, if I remember correctly, two years ago, the DFID had a reform on their bilateral and multilateral aid financing called the BAR and MAR. Um, today, you informed us that uh, you spent, if I, if I understood you correctly, two and a half times more money on fragile countries than on middle-income countries, and you have a certain conflict, well, fund especially designed for conflict-ridden countries. So, considering your long-term career and your expertise, I wanted to ask you how you assess the difference that those reforms have made compared to the past. You know, I would say that every intra-organizational reforms might be reasonably innovative and new and therefore good, but compared to the past, mm -hmm. what's, what's the difference? What, what, what would you, how would you assess that? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Charlotte Merton. I'm currently an intern at GZ and I'll be starting to study here in September actually. I have a question um, concerning your multilateral development system. We pointed out that's very important too. I would like to know how you see the role of international financial institutions, such as the International Development Agent Association, in their role in um, engaging in conflict in fragile states, and how you see opportunities to, for cooperation. And I guess that's a question for the two of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Would you like to go first? Martin? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, just to take these two, these two questions together, I, I think the, I mean, you raise a very serious point about the risk that development agencies can operate in ways which fuel or exacerbate conflict because, because we have resources and our resources can be competed for in the same way that other resources can be competed for. And I, I have read some and observe some, you know, some serious work um, which points up that kind of risk, for example, in Somalia. I think the main, the main thing I would say about, uh, well, two things to say about this. First, please be alive to the fact that, you know, if you have resources and you're in this environment, you, you are a sort of a player. People are thinking about you and, and have a point of view about you and what you're doing and maybe some stuff they want from you. Please, please don't be blind to that. But the second thing, bringing me particularly onto your point is, um, and it, it touches a bit on the comments that, that you made um, earlier on, it's not enough just to build capable institutions in mm -hmm. uh, fragile countries. You have also to build institutions which are responsive and are accountable. Because if you're capable, you know, who knows what you can do? You can, you can um, you know, just be more effective in um, oppressing minorities. If, though, you're also accountable and responsive, uh, you know, you, you are going to do a better job for a wider um, proportion of the population. So think about... Um, 
interventions you can make that will build responsiveness and accountability as well. And, and let's be honest that that takes a very long time sometimes. Hold on to the fact that many countries that we used to um, feel were mired in conflict forever. I worked on Uganda and Mozambique early in my career. We all remember Vietnam and Cambodia. Those countries have moved on. So, you know, you can over time, if you have a long enough time horizon, get to a better place um, and try and have a long-term horizon. I, I think um, your question on, um, your question basically is whether development agencies get better at dealing with new problems as they arise and whether the learning we've done has equipped us um, for the new challenges that we've faced. And, you know, certainly DFID is a completely different organization now than it was when I first joined, and it's also very different than it was 10 years ago. And that's one of the great, exciting things about working development, actually. There's always a new frontier. Um, and you need a mindset which is open to the fact that you're being asked to do different things and will need to learn new skills and capabilities and bring in um, different perspectives and regard that as a you know, regard change basically in your mandate and your agenda as a positive thing rather than um, something to be put up with. Um, I, um, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm maybe by disposition an optimistic person. So I think, I do think life for most people in most developing countries will be better a generation from now as it is massively better than it was a generation ago. But that's not inevitable. And uh, we, can, we can make that true or not true. You know, Jim Kim talks about the role we have in bending the arc of history. And I think that's a great metaphor. And you have to, you have to get on to the next problem and the next challenge if you really want to bend the, the arc of history. On um, what we would like uh, Ida to um, do, this is a very good moment to be asking this question because Jim Kim is trying to raise 15 or 20 billion dollars for the next IDA replenishment and he therefore is all ears on what the German government and the UK government would like through that process. What I would like on this agenda is, um, and he know, you know, I've had this conversation with him and his team, so there's no, there's no news here, but, but what we would like is um, more people uh, with professional skills and delegated responsibilities in the countries. We think being close to the client is really important to be responsive and effective. We would like more resources as a share of the total pot allocated to those countries. And we would like faster processes and faster systems. Um, the World Bank is a great institution, but that doesn't mean it can't be better. And in these countries, there is scope for improvement. Mm -hmm. you, On the question whether aid could actually prolong conflict, um, there's pretty strong evidence that on the emergency side, it actually can. And it's on the emergency aid, I, aid because often these resources are channeled to the rebellious structures. And there's a debate under what conditions should one intervene or not. On the development side, that's certainly discussed at length. And yes, by putting your money on the wrong horse and supporting domestic structures which prolonged conflict, you can do harm. By providing resources for building schools and roads, which are then being, you know, can, money is fungible, resources can be used to build up the military, um, that can prolong conflict. But I must say, there's a lot more caution and recognition of that today than there was 15 years ago. And we work with a multiplicity of instruments. And I said in the beginning that I'm a great believer of providing budgetary resources directly to the government budget under strict supervision for the, that very reason, because then you supervise the whole budget. Because that allows you to also look, at least in principle, into the military budget. And it, you can direct the whole process. But you know, that's difficult to do. And then we work, and let me just make a point, we don't just work on very heavy-handed structures. We work with community-based structures. We work with youth groups, small-scale interventions. In our globalized world, that helps. And we've become much more alert to that 
in, in the period of the internets and communications, and uh, it is not so easy to just work in isolated st uh, uh, states as we did from, st from government to government. So we tend to get caught if we get it do it too wrong, and that's good. Huh? I mean, if we, do t if we put our big resources too much on, on leaders who actually want to prolong contract, hopefully that message today gets out and say, look what these terrible people from the World Bank or these terrible people from that are doing and what it creates, and then we have the press. So today they are much more built in checks and balances than there was before. But to answer your question, in principle, it's possible. You better be damn sure, because if you don't have elected state structures to work with, who are your partners, and you work in, a, in situations of statelessness, and you have to substitute with structures with this statelessness, it's difficult to make sure that you are not building structures which prolong conflicts or make it difficult. But we, certainly all the antennas, I'm not sure how you see that, are out and much more alert today than I would say 10 years ago. Very good. We have time for one more question, perhaps. Is there anybody else who would like to, to ask that question? Then perhaps you allow me a question. No? It's a, it may not be a fair question, but you feel free uh, to uh, not to answer it. But why is it that people react to DFID in generally a, a positive way, uh, like like Andra did in her presentation? Right, we look to DFID and other new ideas, and um, and why doesn't that happen when we mention other development agencies? What is it about DFID that sets you apart from the others? Well, let me just say, if you, know, if you watch the uh, set of questions I face when I go to the British Parliament or you know, when I'm interviewed on the media, I think yeah, it doesn't always feel as positive uh, as maybe you said. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I do think that we've tried hard to improve our organisation. Um, we have been very lucky to um, have had a series of politicians in charge of the department who've valued professional expertise and allowed us to build an organisation and, of course, who have grown the budget for us. I think that's been important. And um, we... So we... we uh, I think th th those are some of the ingredients, anyway. But... I wouldn't. My main point is I wouldn't overdo um, um, the idea that uh, you know um, DFID thinks it's got lots of the answers, or that people are excessively nice to us. I wish some people were a bit nicer to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think certainly in domestic politics, more than abroad. Yeah, I didn't say it was a, a, a fair question after all, uh, but it, it just occurs to me that very few international development agencies have this positive aura about them, and. But you can, think can it's because you more, have... Can I just make yes. one more point? Um, when I was um, starting out, and uh, you talked about Collier, he taught me at college in the, when I was an undergraduate in the early 80s. And in those days, um, the received wisdom was that um, you know, development in these countries was kind of impossible, and aid was a waste of money, mm. and you know, um, there was no prospect of improvement. The risk, no, no serious person can any longer believe those things because the world has improved so dramatically in the last 15 or 20 years for most people, not for everyone, but, you know, massive improvements in life expectancy and access to education, reductions in conflict and violence. No serious person can think development can't work, nor can any serious person any longer think that aid doesn't contribute to that. So I think there's been a general recognition that um, citizens of rich countries can <coughs> draw some comfort from the fact that money spent on attacking these problems can be used well. So I think aid agencies in general are in slightly better odour now than they were um, when I was first in, you know, doing this work. Do you agree, Andre? Well, I thought I'd give you the answer from my perspective, because we were puzzled about that too. Why is DFID, DFID the great agenda setter? And the answer in my environment was, it's the old colonial power. They always <laughs> thought big time, big strategy. And second, it's the good writing skills. 
and maybe we should take that on board in Hattie. <laughs> write fast, write clear, write strategically, not too long, so we can understand it. And don't worry too much of the details. And now let me, because I'm not saying we didn't think you were right all the time. <laughs> and now lastly, let me say something about our German colleagues. We thought if you really needed to know something about rural water, rural roads, microcredit, you didn't go to DFID. You had other institutions. And our German colleagues and other institutions there had, had certain expertise which are not so strategically visible but very, very recognized. So there's a certain division of right. labor between big picture, maybe, yeah, and, you know, sectoral expertise. And, and, but that was good. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, to you both. Um, uh, this, um, we call it a forum where we are here. I think it's Forum A, right? Yeah. Forum A and next door is then Forum B, right? Uh, so Forum A and Forum B have seen uh, uh, numerous debates over the last academic, of this academic year, and we're just coming to the end of the academic year, and I think this is one of our last events we will have. Um, it has very often been interesting, interesting debates, spirited debates, but um, I can't remember it, where we were so positive in tone for most of the evening. Certainly when we talked about the euro, when we talked monetary policy, <laughs> um, I think we're all ready to go south, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so it's, uh, it's actually a very nice ending to, um, uh, to the academic year in that regard, that we uh, end on, well, shall I, how shall I put it, a positive note, right? So thank you so much for coming here and sharing a dose of optimism with us, and thank you very much, Antrad, for your comments, and thank to you, to you all for comments and uh, for questions. Thanks again. I think we have a reception uh, outside, so if you would like to share and mingle a bit, you're most welcome to do so. Thanks again for coming.